Tonight is the 120th Hot Science Cool Talk. That's amazing. The talk will be amazing. It's Detecting Cancer by Touch by Dr. Livia Eberlin. Livia was uh, born and raised in uh, Brazil. And at a young age, she was just really into science. Uh, both of her parents were scientists. And she was like all in from the very beginning. Uh, she's done some amazing things. And I'd like to go through each of the research awards she's won now. I'll only take a few minutes to talk about each of them. Um, so a few things, just a few things I want to say here. One is uh, this MacArthur Fellow is also known as the Genius Award. And almost everything up here is a very significant deal. There's no, there's no lightweight awards amongst, amongst this. But rather than spend all this time going through this, I'd really like to save the time to, so you have time to hear her talking. The only other thing I'll add here is if we couldn't fit all of them on here, there's a whole bunch more that go off the bottom. But once you meet her, you realize that anything before 2009 meant she had to have won those when she was about 12. So um, we're just going to move, move on from here. Please welcome Livia Eberlin to our stage. Well, thank you all for coming. This is really exciting. Um, I was not 12 in 2009. That's not true. It's, uh, I was. 23, so I'm 33 now, and I hope you appreciate tonight the research that not just me, but my team has been doing, developing new technologies, new chemical technologies to help surgeons and clinicians and pathologists make better decisions when treating our cancer patients. So really the main message is how can we better detect and diagnose cancer by using a chemical tech that is entirely based on touching the tissue. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about cancer. I'm sure everyone here in this room um, knows someone in your family or a friend or even yourself that's gone through the painful diagnosis of cancer. Um, cancer is one of, of course, the five top causes of death in the United States, actually ranked two just right after heart disease. It's very common both in women and men. There are a variety of different cancers that exist. Now, if you know someone has had cancer, likely the main treatment option for this patient has been surgery. So surgery remains the main treatment option for cancer patients. Even though we've made incredible progress in new um, chemotherapies and drugs that you can take before surgery, most of the times, majority of cancer patients that have a solid tumor, which is a palpable tumor inside of an organ, will have to undergo a surgical procedure. And when I started doing research in cancer, so I'm a chemist by training, um, we were doing some projects during my PhD, and I was in charge of picking up the samples. So I was the kind of annoying undergraduate researcher that would go and camp out in the hospital, and I would just wait and wait to get a sample, because we want to do chemical analysis of these samples. And it was during that time in the hospitals and in the close to the operating rooms that I started to realize that even though we might have a perception that cancer surgeries are really well-established procedures, um, procedures that are really um, have a really clear protocol, that's when I realized complex, how complex cancer surgeries can be. So for example, this is one of my collaborators, Dr. Potsidis. He's doing one of the most complicated cancer surgeries, in my opinion, which is called the Whipple procedure. That's a surgery that's done to remove pancreatic cancer. So our pancreas is really within our abdominal cavity. It's behind several organs. It's touching five different organs. And now the challenge that a surgeon face is, well, she or he needs to find where the cancer is. You normally have an idea of where the cancer is in the body. And then remove this cancer. And the main goal of cancer surgery is we need to maximize removal of cancer. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of clinical data that shows that to give the patients the highest hope of survival. So for, to tell the patient that after a surgery you have the highest hopes of living a cancer-free life strongly correlates with the fact of being able to remove all of the cancer. So if you leave cancer behind after a surgery, you're really giving a higher chance that this case is going to come back, it's going to recur, it's going to grow again, and then you have to either do a very aggressive chemotherapy postoperatively or another surgery. Now another goal of cancer surgery is that even though you do want to remove all of the cancer, maximum cancer possible, you need to make sure to preserve normal adjacent tissue. So you need to make sure that your patient after this cancer surgery has a good quality of life. 
right? You can't just remove all of the organ um, in many of the cases because you want to give these patients a chance of also having a good postoperative quality of life. One very clear scenario is brain cancer, right? You want to make sure you remove only the cancer and then you preserve as much adjacent normal brain tissue to be, for this patient to be able to live well after. Now the challenge is, even for expert cancer surgeons that have been doing these procedures for a year, it has, it's really difficult by just looking at this tissue that's exposed to recognize the boundary between normal tissue and cancerous tissue. And the reason for that is that cancer cells can look a lot like normal cells. So you may have an impression that visually they are different, but by gross anatomy, they're very similar. So once you get in this region, which we call the cancer margin, the surgical margin, it can be hard to tell if it's cancer cell growing into a normal cell or if it's purely normal cell. So it gets really tricky for even an expert surgeon to recognize this boundary, this surgical margin between normal and cancer tissue. So the technology that surgeons have been using to address this or to verify surgical margins during surgery, it's called frozen section analysis. So what do they do is the following. Once they remove the main uh, piece of tissue with the cancer within it, they send it inside of a dish to an adjacent room. It, that's still within the hospital, but it's not in the operating room. It's like adjacent. So they walk in this door here with this dish with a little piece of tissue. And then they quickly freeze the tissue, and then they color the tissue with um, histologic dyes or stains. And then they have pathologists, which are um, uh, doctors that are very good at looking under a microscope and recognizing patterns of cells, look at these tissues and tell, based on the shape of the cells, the histology and structure of the tissue, if there's still cancer at the boundary between the cancer tissue and the normal tissue. If there's no cancer in this boundary, um, they will call back the operating room, and I cropped the phone here, but they literally call back in the operating room and tell the surgeon, okay, the margin is negative, it's clear. No cancer at the margin, you can wrap up your surgery. Um, or they will say, well, there is cancer at the boundary, and then you need to continue this resection. Now imagine, during this time, the patient is in the operating room, uh, exposed. Um, there is a much higher chances of infection and other complications from being under anesthesia for prolonged times. For the healthcare system, it's also um, a, a really long time that you're prolonging these surgical procedures, and the cost of surgeries because of this analysis can really escalate. So for the healthcare system, this is also not the most optimized process to analyze tissue. But the main issue that I saw as a young scientist was that this analysis is highly subjective. So this method has been used for 100 years, and it's based on a visual evaluation of structure of tissue. Now, what do you guys think happens when you quickly freeze a piece of tissue? What's the main chemical in our body, main compound? Water. So what happens when we freeze water? We form ice crystals. So once you form ice crystals, you really disrupt the morphology of the tissue. So this is exactly what this pathologist is looking at. They're looking at cells on tissue and trying to recognize which cells are cancer and which cells are normal cells. So once you look at this and you have the formation of ice crystals, even for, again, pathologists that are highly expert, it can be difficult to recognize in this boundary region of the tissue piece if these are just normal glands or if they're actually cancer cells. So in about 25% of the times for pancreatic cancer surgery, this reading ends up being wrong. So these patients go home with a, a thought that the surgery was complete, all the cancer has been removed, only to find out in a week or so that in fact the margin was positive and this was an incorrect reading um, due to frozen section analysis. So this means for a patient, of course, devastating news, you either have to come back for a second surgery or proceed with more aggressive treatment options. Now imagine if there was a way that we could actually give the ability to a surgeon to identify if the margins are positive or negative before she or he even resect the tissue from the patient. What if we could enable the surgeon to do this reading, this analysis in real time in the operating room in a time frame that now can completely change treatment for the patients 
and inform them in real time this is actually cancer or this is normal and help provide this better treatment often for, for the patients. So this was really our motivation going into development of the mass spec pen technology. Can we do, can we provide this tool for the surgeons? So the way that we address this go is what we call the mass spec pen. The mass spec pen is a handheld device that is connected to a mass spectrometer, and I'll tell you what that is in a little bit. The whole process is automated and triggered to just a click of a foot pedal. So the main component is this device that is a handheld, and the tip of this pen has a PDMS tip, is a polymer, and I'll tell you more about it too. And inside we have three channels. The first one delivers one water droplet to the tip of the pen, and this water droplet extracts molecules that are characteristic of tissue type. And then we use a vacuum to drag this droplet from the tissue all the way to the mass spectrometer, which reads this molecular information and provides mass spectrum that tells if the tissue was normal or cancer. What's really exciting about the mass spec pen is the way that we engineered the, devi the device is that it is fully biocompatible, easy to use, and it's actually disposable. So you can plug it in and plug it out of your instrument, your mass spectrometer, and throw it away. And in that way, get real-time feedback on the state of the disease, if it's cancer or not. So let me tell you a little bit about how the device works. This was actually our very first 3D printed prototype. Uh, we actually printed um, the very first, maybe 50, in the undergraduate lab here at UT. So this was a work, work done by many undergraduates in my lab, in Thomas Milner's lab, um, designing and developing this technology. So the mass spec pen, as you see here, is analyzing a piece of lung tissue. So the case is just um, to help hold the device. There's nothing really inside of the case. And at the tip, as I told you, we use a polymer that's called polydimethylsiloxane. This is a biocompatible polymer, meaning that is, um, doesn't have any negative effects to the patients. Actually, if you know anyone with an implanted medical device, many medical devices have PDMS. So it's very safe for the patient. So we designed, as I said, this tip, as you can see here, with three conduits, and these conduits meet as a re at a reservoir. The reservoir is really important, because that's where we're going to keep our water droplet for enough time for it to interact with the tissue to extract molecules. So once we fill this reservoir with about 10 microliters of, of water, which is a very tiny drop, um, then this water droplet sits on the tissue for about three seconds. Water is a universal solvent, so it extracts molecules from a sample. In this case here, we're mostly extracting small molecules, like metabolites, lipids, and even some small proteins as well. So we use water, water here for what I say it's a chemical extraction. I teach analytical chemistry to undergrads at UT, and this is one of the very, very basic principles in chemistry, how to use solvents to extract molecules. So the same way that we use water to extract compounds and make a coffee every morning, right? We extract, we use water, we extract caffeine and all of those other compounds and make amazing coffee, which I drink a lot of. Um, we use water to take showers and we extract molecules from our body with water. Here we're using water to extract molecules from a tissue. These molecules are naturally occurring. So we don't have to inject the patient with anything before surgery. These are molecules that are naturally occurring in the body. And we know a lot of biochemistry and biology studies that have shown that the molecules in cancer tissue are very different in their uh, amounts, in their expression, than the molecules in normal tissue. So we can detect that to provide a diagnosis. Then after about three seconds of it touching the tissue, we then um, transport this droplet to the mass spectrometer where we do analysis of these compounds. Now we use 3D printing, which is a really cool technology. So we can be creative about this diameter here. We've gone down to um, a half a millimeter, which is 500 micrometers, up to five millimeters, and that will really depend on the surgical needs. Some surgeries you want to analyze a larger area, some you want to analyze a smaller area. So we have the capability of adapting our device to the surgical needs of, of the surgeon. So I'm sure you guys are thinking, what is mass spectrometry? And I could talk about mass spec for hours, and I'm not going to do that today. My PhD is in mass spectrometry, so um, of course, I'm very passionate about the technology. But I want to show you a graph to tell you what is the data that we record. 
So in the mass spectrometer, in we, what we detect is the molecules that are inside of a sample. So in that case of the mass spec pan, our sample is that water droplet with the extracted molecules from the tissue. In the x-axis, what you see is the mass of the molecules. So every single molecule has a mass, depending on the chemical structure. And in Y, you have the abundance, how much of the molecule is in the tissue. So you could look at all of these numbers and say, oh, I have no idea what these mean. But we are mass spectrometers. We're chemists. We can identify every single one of these peaks based on the mass of the compounds. So now we can say, oh, 175 is ascorbic acid. Do you guys know what is ascorbic acid? Vitamin C, very common in our cells. These are some fatty acids like oleic acid, arachidonic acid. They are very common in our cells. And then in the higher mass range, we detect lipids. Lipids are part of our cellular membrane. So if you have a cancer cell or a normal cell, you're going to have a very different expression of these molecules. So even if you say, OK, I didn't understand anything, that's fine. Uh, we can assign the chemical structures. And what we do actually um, um, perform in this analysis is a comparison of these spectra. So even if you don't know what these molecules are, you know, I'm not really interested in mass spectrometry, look at the patterns, just the patterns of these peaks. So this is a high-grade ovarian cancer tissue. This is a low-grade, much less aggressive ovarian cancer tissue. And this is normal tissue, no ovarian cancer. And if you look at the pattern of these molecules, you can tell that this is different from this and different from this, right? So you can recognize, based on the expression of these molecules, what's a mass spectrum or a spectrum that's characteristic of a really aggressive ovarian cancer, a moderately aggressive ovarian cancer, and a normal tissue. And based on these mass spectra, I'll tell you how we use artificial intelligence to then provide this automated diagnosis to the surgeon. So my favorite feature about the mass spec pen is actually how the analysis is done in a very gentle way. So the analysis is what we call non-destructive. And why is that? Well, let's look. If we're doing the analysis of a tissue after it's been removed from the body, which we also call ex vivo tissue, this is a piece of tissue before analysis. This is ovarian cancer. This is during analysis. This is right at the tip of our pen. You see here the reservoir? You're probably able to see it. And then after analysis, there's no visual damage to the tissue. There's no damage. So we're using a water droplet. And just think about it. We're just sitting a water droplet in the tissue and then extracting that water droplet. So even for a pathologist, if we take a section right where we analyze, she or he would not be able to identify that it has been analyzed at all. And I can tell you from my experience being in medical research and developing new technologies, the ability to provide a new technology without interfering with the clinical workflow is very important for, for um, being accepted um, by clinical professionals. So for me to tell a surgeon or a pathologist, we've developed a technology that we use a water droplet in a polymer that's biocompatible, and we're not altering your tissue. You can still do standard pathology, right? You can still do other analysis. It's very important for um, surgeons and clinicians to be able to accept it into a workflow. And this has really been a key aspect um, by which we have been able to move our technology into the operating room. So at first, and these are some images of animals for the little ones. So uh, <laughs> this is a animal. So this is a, a mouse that's been implanted with a human tumor. This is before analysis. This, and this is a live a mouse. This is during analysis. And this is after. OK, and again, if you look at this tumor here and after, you wouldn't be able to tell that, that any analysis has been done at all. So it's a very gentle process of chemical extraction. So I've been telling you about the handheld device and the mass spectrometer, which are really important to our technology. So the device, the mass spec pen in itself, is what these surgeons interact with. This is the foot pedal that triggers the process. Then we have our mass spectrometer, which does the molecular analysis. We have it in, in a in a rolling table, so we can actually move it around. And then a major part of my research actually is in statistical classification and software. So we use statistical classifiers to build models that can predict, based on that pattern of molecules that I showed you, if a tissue is cancer or norm. And I'll tell you just a little bit more about it. So I like to show this figure. 
And the reason is when we published this paper in Science Translational Medicine, I was telling Jay this story, um, one of the reviewers said, well, that's a really good schematic, but does it really look like that? So I had um, Jeling Zhang, my research associate, who was very important in this research, do the exact same position in motion. I wanted to be in this picture, but I was um, nine months pregnant last time. I didn't tell you this part, so I was pretty much covering the whole device. Um, <laughs> But I had him stand and hold the pen. This is our pen. Obviously, this is not the really right orange tone, but it's our burnt orange box um, that integrates with the commercial mass spectrometer. And here's the foot pedal. So hook him. <laughs> yeah. And this is our software here classifier. So how do we build these um, models? And I like to use this example. Um, if you use Facebook, I'm sure you guys do, right? Just say the truth. You like Facebook. <laughs> if you upload pictures to Facebook, what is one thing that Facebook can do really well? Recognize your face, right? So facial recognition is based on artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms. It's based on feature analysis, right? On the set of features that you train your classifier to recognize this is John, this is Mary, um, whoever. Um, so the more pictures you upload to Facebook, the better it gets, right, at recognizing your face. So this is because you're training your model, your mathematical statistical model that's running behind the scenes, the scene, to recognize if this is you or your cousin or your son or your daughter, correct? Um, the same way here, we use these complicated mathematical models, uh, statistical classification models, to train um, on a set of data that we say this is cancer, the same way you say this is me, we say classification model, this is cancer pattern, this is normal pattern, this is high grade, this is low grade, this is normal, and we train these mathematical models to recognize based on a subset of those molecules if a tissue is cancer or normal. So we use tissue that we say are histologically validated. So these are tissues that we know for sure are cancer, we know for sure are normal. Then we use them, we train our model, and then we come up with these classification models that then will give positive weights in red for the features that characterize cancer, and negative rates in green for the, the, the features that characterize normal tissue. And then once we build this model, now we can use it to predict on new data, like a new picture that you upload, if, if this is cancer or a normal pattern. And in that way, the more we upload, the more data that we get, that we know is validated, we get better and better models that can automatically recognize this is a pattern of normal, this is a pattern of cancer tissue. And that's how we do it, to be able to assist surgeons to get that response in real time. So this is an analysis of what we're doing here. This is a piece of normal tissue. We built this graphical user interface to really uh, make it easy for us to use in the clinic. So you select, this is mass spec pan analysis in the tissue, and then it will provide the diagnosis with the probability. So this is a piece of cancer tissue that's being analyzed, and you will see this is the mass spectrum that I explained you about. And then our classifiers automatically go through that data and tell in, in, in near real time if this is a cancer tissue with the associated probability. Okay, and I forgot to tell you this, but the entire process from when you touch the tissue to when you get a diagnosis is under 10 seconds right now. So it's about a 10 seconds um, per region that is analyzed. So we have now applied the mass spec pin on, actually we're about over 900 tissues. And these are tissues that have been removed from the body that we analyze here in the Norman Heckerman building in my lab. Um, they are all, throughout all of the tissues, the analysis has been non-destructive and still at below 10 seconds. We've been looking at brain cancers, um, different subtypes, gliomas and meningiomas, thyroid cancer, follicular adenomas, papillary carcinomas. These are just different types of cancers that it's really important to recognize because you may take completely different drugs, right? Completely treatment options. Lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, and breast cancer. We're also doing a project in endometriosis. And these are all my incredible students that are working on all of these projects, my grad students, and making really enormous progress to demonstrate that the technology works across a variety of different solid tumors. Now let me tell you a little bit of the complexity though in this analysis. I started introducing this problem with pancreatic cancer because as I said, it's a really difficult cancer to perform surgery on, but it's also a very heterogeneous cancer. 
So this is, um, in pancreatic cancer, it's a very infiltrative cancer. So even if you have the bulk of the cancer where most of the tumor cells is, once you get to the margin, it really goes in the normal tissue and kind of mingles with the normal cells. So it can be very tricky to recognize. And for patients that are um, able to undergo surgery, it's really important to clear the margins to make sure that there are chances of survival. But when we get these tissues, we may get a diagnosis as normal tissue. So even between two regions that we're analyzing, let's say we analyze here and then this adjacent region. This is here a region of what we would call normal cells. So you see we're using pathology to recognize this tissue and tell us this is really normal cells. But within a few micrometers, we have this other region which is purely chronic inflammation. So within the same piece of normal tissue from the same patient, there are mixed cellular compositions that are really important to be recognized for this analysis. So if you look at a piece of cancer tissue from the same patient, you may have in this corner here a lot of concentrated tumor cells, or in another piece of the tissue, regions where you have a mixture of tumor cells and normal cells. So in order for us to be able to know exactly what we're analyzing and recognizing the composition, we started to do kind of a cancer map of the tissue, where in the tip of our pan, we use surgical dyes. So when we analyze it, we actually stamp it as well. So now we know exactly where we analyzed on the tissue, and we can precisely validate this region that we analyzed had normal cells, inflammation, or a mixture of normal and tumor cells. So that's what we're saying here, that we're making a map of the tissue. So we not only can tell what's the diagnosis, but we know several regions where we analyze what's the cellular composition. So this is an example of our data with pancreas. Um, this is a normal pancreas mass spectrum. And I know now you all can recognize what these molecules are, but let's just look at the patterns. This is a pattern of a normal pancreas tissue. Ascorbic acid, again, this is glucose, sugar, glucose, fatty acids, phospholipids. And this is a spectrum of pancreatic cancer. And you see expression completely different of these molecules as well as some of the small molecules as well. So if we use this beautiful data, purely normal, purely cancerous tissue, we have 99% accuracy in diagnosing cancer, which is absolutely exciting. And then we started to look at some samples with mixed composition. So now these are pieces of tissues that have cancer in some cells of cancer, some cells are normal, some cells are inflammation, some cells are necrotic, bad cells. There's blood, blood vessels, there are adjacent stroma. So all of this complexity of the amazing biological tissues that we are made of can be uh, in part of our tissues that we analyze. So we've been really doing a lot of work here in collaboration with our pathologists, looking one by one in all of these samples with all of the annotation from clinical pathology and seeing, well, for example, this sample had 5% tumor cells, and we did correctly classify it as cancer. So this would be a characteristic of cancer, so you need to remove that, even though it's just 5%. This is 10 to 20% tumor cells with inflammation and some stroma, which is normal tissue. We also correctly classified, but then there are cases that are more complex. This is 25% tumor, 75% stroma, normal tissue, and we misclassified this one as normal tissue. So we really need to do, as a scientist in developing new technology, be very careful about validation, and that's what we're doing now. How do we work with these complex samples and develop even better classifiers to tell, even with mixed composition, to give the doctor the right diagnosis? Okay, another part of our pancreatic cancer study is looking at metastatic cancer. So the pancreas is actually in close contact with the bile duct. So this is the bile duct going through the pancreas, and this is the head of the pancreas. So a very common margin, which I explained to you, margin in the surgery that is evaluated, is what we call the bio margin. And that is the surgeon removes this cancer, and then they evaluate here the margin between the pancreas and the bile duct if there's still cancer in the bile duct. And that's very important because if the cancer is going beyond the pancreas, then you might need to remove adjacent tissue um, to make sure you get maximal excision. So we started to analyze normal bile duct. This is the spectrum here, a lot of bile acids. And then we analyzed also pancreatic cancer, and you see the profile here. And what's really cool to see is that the bile duct that does have the metastatic cancer, the, the, the cancer spreading into, has a mixed profile. 
with molecules that are characteristic of pancreatic cancer and molecules that are characteristic of norbile. So here's to show you that if you were doing this during surgery and analyzing this region between the pancreas and the bile duct, one would be able to recognize that this bile duct has metastatic cancer and needs to be removed. Okay, so I can explain and explain to you for hours, and I love doing this. You can come out of my lab and we can show you the technology, but Dr. Weber and Gray's Anatomy can explain it to you in a much simpler way, so let's watch it. So when you apply the path pin to tissue, it rapidly identifies whether a cell is healthy or cancerous. So you're showing us a mock-up. No, no, it's functional. I mean, it's still in the testing stage, but uh, at this point, approximately 80% of all tumor types we sampled are in the database, and we hope for 100% in the next few months. Wow. The pen uses That is impressive. Impressive. It's like a drug-sniffing dog for cancer. We're screwed. Shh. Our idea is good, too. ...the mass spectrometer, which compares biomarkers from the tissue with those of the cancer cells in the database. You say compare biomarkers from the tissue, and you all can explain that now better than him. So they actually um, used a pen during surgery, and this is actually my favorite scene from the series of episodes that they feature it. It really works? Well, it's supposed to. It's still in the testing stage. We're testing it? On this guy? He, he's got a wife and two kids. They're very nice, and they really, really want him to stay alive. And I promised them I'd make sure he gets the best possible care. So maybe, Dr. Gray, if you could just tell Schmidt, Dr. Wilson. be quiet. She's got it. Hey, look, the distal end. <laughs> Adenocarcinoma. But if I go one centimeter approximately. It works. <laughs> it's working. Oh my god. I'm gonna save half his stomach. And now you get to go tell his family that not only did you save his life, you saved his quality of life. It's really cool, right? So that really is the main message. Not only would you save his life, a patient's life, but hopefully save quality of life by ensuring maximum excision and minimizing excision of normal tissue. So we actually have a real life Gray's Anatomy. Um, we did um, move our instrument and our setup to um, Baylor College of Medicine at the Texas Medical Center in Houston. The Texas Medical Center, they see over 5 million patients a year. So it's really an incredible resource for us to be doing um, this validation study. Um, we got this, of course, IRB approved. This is approved by our institutional review board that oversees all of the research with human subjects. All of the patients are consented. They agree to participate in the research. So uh, we take a lot of um, responsibility in conducting human subject research in the, in the, in the right way. Um, this was uh, five to six months until we got the approval to actually be doing that. So this is um, my undergraduate researchers, my graduate students, and my postdoc. We all work together in making these pens. I often get questioned like, where do you manufacture this? And I'm like, uh, Norman Hackerman Building in UT Austin. So it's all made in our lab using 3D printers. We make, we've made more than 300 pens now. Um, we pack them all up in these sterile bags. We ship them off to Houston. It gets sterilized with their common um, sterilization um, uh, instruments at Baylor. So once it's there, it's kind of their medical device and they use it, um, the surgeons use it. So this was the day that we actually shipped our instrument and our interface. This is a, a version two. Um, it can run two pins in parallel. So if you're using one and you want to switch to a different one, it's ready to go. There's no um, delay time in between. This is me, my research associate, and my graduate student, Martha Sands, really happy when we shipped our instrument. Um, this was our very day of our very first surgery. So this was exactly, almost exactly a year ago. So September of 2018, I was there for the first surgery. This is Dr. James Sullivan, um, my main partner at Baylor. Um, he's probably the surgeon that's used the mass spec pin the most. Um, he's, uh, his expertise in his thyroid cancer surgery, so this is most of his practice. This is the mass spectrometer installed in the operating room and ready to go before our analysis. So it's been really cool to see how well our technology has integrated within the operating suite. These are two mass spec pins that are primed and ready to go for analysis. Um, we had to extend our tube. We started in the lab with a tube that was about one meter, and now we are almost five meters from the operating room. And that's because the tube has to go down through the floor to make sure it's not a tripping hazard. 
all the way up to our mass spectrometer for analysis. So the way that we envision this really is to have a smaller instrument that can roll in closer to the patient. The technology is there. We now need to work with manufacturers of the mass spectrometers to make a clinically suited version of these instruments. So um, this is the surgical instrument tray, and a lot of the times the mass spec pins are just going to be part here of the surgical tray. This is actually them setting up a mass spec pin right before um, the surgery started. This, the patient is laying here. This is my graduate student, Clara. And we get this in here that plugs in the mass spectrometer. And then the mass spec pins stay here within the sterile field, so fully sterilized and um, to be used in the patient. So one of the things that we were really um, wanting to make sure is that this was a completely safe technology for the patient. So we assured patient safety by working with sterilizable materials. Everything is sterilized, biocompatible. Even the water that we use now for our solvent, for our water droplet, is the sterile water that's in the operating room. So it's all safe for the patient. Really well adapted into the workflow. We wanted to see if we could inter overcome potential interferences in vivo. One of the things we've got most actually about is blood. And yes, a lot of the times there's blood over the tissue. Um, a surgeon will not operate with ex excessive bleeding. So it will never be the case that there's just blood going everywhere, right? I mean, that you, can always, you always have to have ble bleeding under control, so you cauterize regions with bleeding. But there's still blood in the surgical field. And you can clean it up, but there's still residual blood on top of the tissue. And what's really cool is that mass spectrometry is so sensitive, has such a high level of chemical specificity, that even though we do see components of the blood, this is heme, the main component of blood. This is hemoglobin, the main protein in our blood. We still detect those molecules that I was telling you about that are diagnostic of disease. So here's glucose, the fatty acids, and the phospholipids together with the blood compounds. So it's, it's neat that we are detecting more blood now, but we still detect the molecules that are diagnostic. So we've been doing analysis on living tissue and, of course, in the patients under anesthesia. We also did the analysis on the tissue right after it's been removed. So we both do in the patient, outside of the patient, and we want to correlate the data to see um, how it's working. So this is the pen used, being used in a thyroid procedure. So right here in the neck. And you see it, it's so quick. I'll play it again for you. You hear the tra? That's when the analysis is done. So the surgeon can know that they can remove the, the pen from the tissue. So the time that it interacts with the patient now is from three to five seconds. And then we have our system set up here for analysis. So yes, we can acquire molecular information from fleshly excised tissue, and we can acquire molecular information from living tissues as well. So I wanted to finish by telling you about a specific case. This was actually the very first breast cancer patient that we did. It was a very special case for us. Um, we went in. Um, this was a full mastectomy that the patient was undergoing, so the entire breast was going to be removed. Um, our surgeon that we were working with, uh, Dr. Stacy Carter, um, she was uh, guiding us in this analysis and really helping us. And we wanted to analyze the region of normal tissue and the region of cancer tissue. And she said, OK, we'll do the analysis of cancer and normal. This was our first patient. So we got this beautiful mass spectrum of um, living tissue. This is inside of the body in two regions, this first region and the second region. And Dr. Carter has assured us with all of her um, expertise that this was a region of completely normal breast, really far from the tumor. And then this second region was the region within the cancer. So we were able to get a spectrum of normal breast and the spectrum of cancer tissue. So then we ran our analysis after the surgery and we got the prediction. Both of our mass spec pen predictions came back as normal tissue. So of course, we were slightly disappointed. This is our very first case of breast cancer, uh, a breast cancer patient, and both of our analyses came back as normal when the surgeon knew that the tissue being analyzed was breast cancer. Well, we waited for a week, right, which is what most patients do to get a final diagnosis on this tissue. And then we found out from the post-operative pathology report, this is like the final word in, in terms of diagnosis, that there was no residual carcinoma seen in this patient. So this patient, she had undergone chemotherapy before surgery, 
and she completely responded to chemo to the point that her entire breast looks now normal tissue. So all of the cancer has, has been shrunk down. There was no cancer cells remaining. She would still need to do the mastectomy, but there was a complete pathologic response in both regions that we analyzed had no tumor. So in fact, we agreed with the postoperative pathology in that both these regions that we analyzed were normal tissue, and this patient didn't have any more cancer remaining. So to think that we could have been giving this information in real time and providing this in less than 10 seconds to the surgeon, that would really be transformative in guiding these surgical procedures and helping the surgeons know with the accuracy of molecular diagnosis where it needs to be cut and where it not, does not need to be cut. So I'll finish with that. Uh, I'll summarize that the mass spec pen is a very simple to use device. A lot of people ask us, how long do you train the surgeons? And we're really like, here's the pen, um, go ahead. And you just touch in the tissue and you'll hear a doo you can take it out. So it's very easy to use. And again, you're all welcome to stop by in my lab and um, test it. Very non-destructive to the tissue, not harmful. Um, one of the things that we're doing now is we're integrating it into robot, robotic surgeries. So we have a version that will drop in the body through a trocar and a robot will manipulate the mass spec pen. So the robot that's doing the surgery can use the mass spec pen for analysis as well. And, um, and it really will inform the surgeon when less aggressive surgery is needed, just as the case that I show you when most of the tissue was still normal. So our hope really is not only to save lives, but increase the quality of life for cancer patients. And myself and my team are fully committed to continuing a lot of work still that, let, that heads ahead of us to validate this technology and move it towards implementation in, in as many hospitals as possible um, to, to help with clinical decisions. So I want to uh, thank my incredible lab. These are all um, young investigators, very passionate about new technology, taking risks in technology development and being creative and, and thinking of new tools and how can we um, you know, shift the paradigm and, and clinical decisions and surgical practice. These are here a, a group of undergraduates, graduate students, a couple postdocs. Um, they're really passionate about this work. I have to thank my clinical collaborators. These are, are surgeons that have been trained on specific methods that have been working really well for decades, but take the risk in testing something new. So I am really thankful that they would um, kind of join us in this project and use it every day. Like, so all of these surgeons here have used the mass spec pen um, in their practices, and these are our pathologists that provide support for us in analyzing these tissues. And of course, we've now just passed 100 patients. So these are patients that are undergoing probably the the most nerve-wracking procedure of their lives, cancer surgery, and they still consent to participate in research. So incredibly uh, thankful for them. In our funding, UT for Believing in Me, my startup fund, which helped me start four years ago here, the NIH, CPRIT, um, very important, and a bunch of foundations that have kind of come and joined us in this journey, and a couple private companies, Thermo and Intuitive, also for providing support. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Livia. Yeah. That was awesome. Do we have questions through the uh, through the Slido app? And so, why don't I why don't I ask you some? Okay. Yeah. So the first question is. From Chloe R, she says, is this able to perform on an animal such as a dog? If so, would it be different? Oh yeah, that's a really good question. So we've, we have started, like a, our very early studies were on animal models, we mostly use mice. Um, there's a lot of cases of veterinary surgery where dogs develop cancer just like humans. So breast cancer, ovarian cancer, bladder cancer are very common in, in, in dogs. Um, so yeah, it could be used in, in veterinary surgery to help guide surgical excision in the same way as in human surgery. Um, we see an incredible similarity uh, between the molecules in our cells and in animals. Um, of course, we would need to retrain our classifiers for animal tissue, but um, overall, I'm, I'm pretty confident it would work well. All right, here comes a question from Anonymous. Does the temperature of the water droplets make a difference in oh, performance? that's such a great question. Why was it anonymous? I never want to know who asked. Um, 
Um, we have tested that. We have. Um, we decided to go with room temperature water to make it um, just easier to use. Um, but uh, hot water, I believe, um, provided a higher extraction efficiency where we were able to remove more molecules from the tissue. But it was still not, the change wasn't enough to justify having to heat up a water. So we stayed with the room temperature. Also from Anonymous, how do you maximize the water droplet surface interaction to get the most amount of sample? Oh, these are great these questions. These are really good questions. These and are. you might get an offer of a fellowship to join her research group <laughs> as a graduate student if you'd reveal who you were. Okay, so maximize, can you repeat that? Yes. It's so hard, I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, where did it go? Uh, how do you maximize the water droplet surface interaction to get the most amount of sample? Yeah. So what defines the surface interaction from the water droplet with the tissue is that size of the reservoir. So it's literally like a, a circular um, region. Um, if we have bigger sizes, we extract more molecules because there's more water interacting with the tissue. But we don't want to go too big because there are situations where you want to probe smaller regions of the tissue. You also don't want to go too small because then we extract too little molecules. So we often use three millimeters, which is a good compromise between getting as many molecules as we can with a dimension that is well used by the surgeons. Excellent. Also from Anonymous, will the patient still have to undergo anesthesia? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So all surgeries are performed under anesthesia, and depending on, independent on what technologies are being used. Um, and that's because our technology is not to visualize cancer before surgery. It's really within the context of that tissue being exposed. So you will have to get the cancer removed and then analyze the regions in question. Also from Anonymous, this person's very busy. What are the cons of this device? What are the what? The cons. What are the... Th cons. Yeah. What? Cons? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think one of the challenges is that we are using machine learning, artificial intelligence. Of course, it's amazing technology. But that also means that we're continuously training models. So if we don't have a tissue in our classifier, it's not going to be correctly classified. Now think about the number of cancer types that exist. We're, being, we're so good at typing cancer, right? You use molecular biology, genetic modifications, uh, mutations, so you know there's so many different types of cancer. That means that we also have to include those in our classifiers. So it's kind of like an exponential thing where it's a huge amount of data that, data that need to be considered. Uh, technical challenge is reusability for us. We're trying to incorporate wash cycles. Um, I like to say when you like sip, um, imagine if you have a straw, you know, you drink a little sip of um, Coke Zero, and then you go to water, you still kind of taste that Coke Zero, right? Because there's some that gets retained in the tube. In the same way in our pan, we have some carryover between analysis, so we're developing washing cycles that can quickly run through and clean the device. So that would be like a technical challenge that we're working on now from an engin engineering perspective. Excellent. How much does the mass spec pen cost, Lawrence C. asks? How does this compare with surgery costs? Ooh, that's a good question, too. Surgeries are really expensive. But um, the mass spec pen, the handheld device on itself, is all plastic, very cheap. Um, we make them for a, you know, a few dollars each. Um, the really expensive thing is the mass spectrometer. So a mass spectrometer is a few hundred thousand dollars. So probably 200,000, 300,000, I know everybody's like, oh, it's so expensive. Well, uh, an MRI or a CT scan, they're the, all like major medical um, instrumentation is expensive. Our expectation is that we would have a much smaller unit at a reduced cost that would roll in between operating rooms. So major hospitals will have, let's say, 10 operating rooms. So you'd have one mass spectrometer that hopefully will run for like maybe 100 to $200,000. It's a one-time purchase. And then you use it in several different operating rooms. And it, you know, the life cycle of these instruments are years. And then the mass spec pans, which are the cheaper part, right, like a few dollars each, then, well, at least at the research stage, that would be the disposable unit that you just toss it and, and buy a new one. Olivia, several people are asking about using this technology on skin cancer. Can mm. you use this to get all the affected tissue without having to go through the typical procedures? Yeah, that's a, that's a great case. So we just started our project with skin cancer. We're using it for two purposes. One is to screen lesions that you don't know what the diagnosis is. I don't know if anyone here has a history in their family of skin cancer, but if you do, you may have to come in 
and they will shave the regions of um, like something that doesn't look right. So we want to be able to do the analysis with the mass spec pen before and see in a non-destructive way if that's cancer or normal, but also in most surgery, which is can, um, cancer surgery, we can help determining margins. We hope to be able to. Excellent. I've got a question just to clarify. So what Gray's Anatomy portrayed was your discovery specifically. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, so we published it in September 2017, our first paper, and it got some attention from the media. And it was actually uh, an article from the Smithsonian Museum that the, um, the Gray's Anatomy producers read. They called me. I was on maternity leave, but I remember getting that call. And we talked for like about an hour, and then they just like this, like I don't hear anymore from Grey's Anatomy. They're like, oh, we may feature in the show. And I'm like, oh, great. Um, and then like maybe like six months later, three days before the episode came on, someone contacted me and said, oh, we're going to feature it like in, like in the next episode. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> like I thought like I was going to proofread it or like and I see it before. Like is this right? I thought like they're just gonna have like a pen with no tube and it's just like, okay, then where's the mass spectrometer? But they did an incredible job. I didn't show all the scenes. They feature it in three episodes. In one of the episodes, they literally roll in a mass spectrometer and you saw the mass spectrometer there, right? right? So they did a really good job. So, um, but it's funny because, um, so I'm from Brazil and um, when some of the news came out there of the mass spec pen, some people literally wrote, like, I saw this in Grey's Anatomy. This is not an original idea. <laughs> like, this is what Dr. Weber thought about. And I just liked it. I just liked it. <laughs> Another one from Anonymous. How did you come up with the idea of the mass spectrum? Oh, that's good. I get that question. So when I was applying for academic jobs, um, I had been in this field of like using mass spectrometry for diagnosis, um, but always as a lab kind of tool. So I started to think, what are the things that we need to change with our current technology to make it in a way that's so simple and easy to use that um, that interface with the doctor would be um, easily acceptable and something that can be used routinely. So I thought about you know something that's handheld that you can just probe and analyze, and that kind of concept came to my mind and I wrote a proposal about it and got funding from the NIH and then wrote it as part of my application jobs and UT thought it was a good idea. I'm glad. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So here's some related questions. I'll ask them together. Uh, have you faced any hardships as a woman in science and what advice do you have for an aspiring woman in science? Oof. So I would start by saying that it, the current climate for being a woman in science is, is amazing. Um, you know, we actually give more degrees to, um, and now in chemistry, actually equal amount of PhDs to women and men, undergraduate the same way. Um, what I think is still missing and what's difficult is in higher positions, especially in academia and industry, so you don't see as many CEOs that are women or like deans or provosts or, or presidents. So that's really where still I think there needs to be a change. But you know, even in terms of like research support, we're seeing a lot of foundations coming and, and supporting women and giving more, visibility, uh, more um, visibility in a bigger platform. And for me, what was, when I was in, in, even in my postdoc, like I didn't really have like a mentor or role model, so that was hard. Like I, I wanted to have kids, and I didn't really see a lot of, you know, like really successful women like in that kind of a position. So, but I think now it's changing. So it's a lot more where you have these role models. Um, I have a, part, a partnership with L'Oreal for Women in Science, uh, L'Oreal Cosmetics. They give money um, for women and, and younger um, women that are interested in a career in science. So we, I, I run a mentorship program with them and try to provide support to um, younger women that are interested in sciences. So I think in that way we can all push and move forward, um, in, including more women in scientific careers. You know, I see a lot of uh, middle school women students here. If they're all interested in like becoming you, what would you tell them to do? Uh, work hard. Just work hard and um, find something that you're truly passionate about. Because, you know, it looks like, oh, this all worked. It's, it was perfect. It worked perfectly. But it wasn't like that, right? We had several steps in the process where it was really difficult. We had to change things and rethink. And research, you know, can be really consuming. 
Um, so unless you really have a passion and a go um, to focus on and keep working on, um, you know, it can, it can get you to the point where you're like, okay, maybe I should be doing something else. And that's really where you don't want to be. So recognize something that you love doing, you know, whatever it is, and then work really hard at it. Um, and even if you don't have perfect A's, um, that's not what's more important, really your passion and your desire to work hard and learn. Awesome. Let's thank Dr. Everlin once again. Thank you. Thanks so much.